So uh, morning everyone, my name's Helen and I work for Devon Wildlife Trust on the Green Minds project in Plymouth. Uh, we're a partner on this exciting Plymouth City-led project, uh, which is funded uh, by the European Regional Development Fund's Urban Innovative Actions. So it's a really good experience for the Wildlife Trust to bring our experience and enthusiasm for wildlife and nature to a large city uh, like Plymouth. And one of the things that we're looking at on Green Minds is this whole idea of urban rewilding and connecting bits of the city together with green corridors. Um, and this session today is part of a bespoke set of sessions that we've designed for Green Mind partners uh, to uh, sort of upskill and share knowledge amongst every, all the different partners who are working on the project. Um, and I think, as most of you know, if, if you want to find out more about other events that we're doing on Green Minds, you can visit the greenmindsplymouth.com website and there's lots of news and information. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ben and Elliot from Citizen Zoo, uh, who are based in London and they've been working on a lot of exciting rewilding projects around London. So it'd be really great to hear about their experiences and then have a chat after we talk about if we've got any questions. So uh, over to you guys. Brilliant, thanks so much, Helen. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly. Um, I just check, can everyone see that? Brilliant. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Cool. So without further ado, I'll make, uh, make a start. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Stockwell and I am Citizen Zoo's Urban Rewilding Officer. Um, and I'm also joined here today by Citizen Zoo's co-founder, Elliot Newton, um, who will be presenting with me as well. Um, so just as a kind of overview, what we'll be pitching you today or talking about is all of the projects that we're working on. Um, the majority of them, I think, will be very much relevant to the kind of Plymouth setting. And applicable to the landscape um, but very much I think uh, it's also kind of bearing in mind the templates that we've used in terms of community engagement and how we get people involved um, particularly with reference to some of the more um, like rural projects that we have and how we engage urban people within those projects um, as well so just in terms of how we're going to run the session um, I'm going to quickly just run through a bit of background about who we are um, we quite light touch just because we're going to be going through all of our projects anyway um, later in the presentation I'll then hand over to Elliot um, who will be giving a very broad overview and a background on rewilding um, and then specifically looking how we uh, apply that to an urban context we'll then be running through all of our projects so both here in London and also working further afield out in Norfolk um, and again kind of putting that focus on how we engage local communities um, and get people involved of those kind of environmental solutions um, and how you could use them as templates yeah in terms of, uh, within a the uh, Plymouth uh, setting um, and then we'll also run through just a few other relevant urban case studies with a particular focus here in London um, and yeah again how they could be applied to uh, Plymouth as well and then as Helen said we'll we'll break we'll have a short break um, and then there'll be a chance for a discussion and some questions and answers. So just quickly in terms of who we are um, so our core mission is to rewild our future um, and we, we do this through um, community-led species reintroductions and habitat restoration projects, um, which will hopefully become clear when we go through all of our different projects. Um, but we have a real focus on the rewilding of people, um, so kind of pe putting people at the heart of those um, environmental solutions um, and empowering them to make a difference both on, kind of on their doorstep for local, for local wildlife. Um, so I will quickly hand it over now to Elliot, who will be going through uh, yeah, what rewilding is more broadly. Thank you, Ben, and hello, everybody. Um, I think that's a great introduction, Ben. I was setting the context well. So what I'm going to do is give you an introduction of what we think rewilding is. If we were stand, if we were sitting in a in a hall right now, I'd ask people to put their hands up and ask what they what rewilding means to them and if they, how they've come across the term historically. But because we're a bit tight for time, I'm going to try and just give you what it means, how we interpret the term and a bit of bit of history about what, where that term came from. So rewilding is actually a very fast emerging term. It was first used in the 90s in the American context by um, two Americans called Sol and Noss. And that was more around reintroducing, as you can see by this picture here, large carnivores to large landscapes. We've got these big corridors um, <coughs> uh, and um, 
and just demonstrating the sort of the trophic cascade that is then uh, imparted by putting these apex predators back into a system. So it was very much about restoring large scale landscapes and making sure all the pieces of that ecological puzzle are in place to enable an ecologically functioning landscape. However, as the term has progressed over the last sort of 20 years, especially with people like George Monbiot in his 2013 book, Feral, the term has taken on more a life of its own, I suppose. And it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. I think one thing to recognize in a rural context, rewilding can be quite an affronting uh, uh, and contentious term in which a lot of farmers can be alienated. However, using it in an urban landscape, we find that has actually a different sort of uh, lands differently and actually it can, it can excite people in ways that saying ecological restoration um, uh, may not. And it gives us a hook in which we can try and engage a whole range of people. So uh, hopefully for the presentation today, you'll, you'll get a feel how we interpret rewilding. But in the urban context, we sort of see it as maximizing the biodiversity potential where possible and making sure we're rewilding people as part of that process. And that obviously works at scales. And we'll go through different scales today, but you, we would put the notion forward that you can rewild a balcony or rewild a windowsill or rewild a lamppost or rewild a park or rewild larger spaces. Because obviously within the urban settings, we still do have pretty large parks. And we think you can actually then maybe implement some of those rewilding um, processes and principles onto those settings and some of those projects will hopefully um, hopefully uh, uh, exemplify that. Um, so this is a really interesting study actually that was conducted by uh, Rewilding Europe which are a great organization. If you've not heard of them, I suggest you give them a Google or they're sort of pioneering all sorts of things at the moment and how to monetize rewilding and how you measure rewilding and how you can implement rewilding on vast landscapes across Europe. But they did a study about urban rewilding and looking at what it did, it looked at, um, uh, uh, it looked at all the capital cities across continental Europe and it put them on using this habitat matrix. It gave them all a different score about how well these um, these cities did in terms of their ecological intact intactness, looking at the ecological value of the spaces, looking at how connected it was. And interestingly, uh, if you look at the top of the scale, actually Slovenia came out on top with its capital city, Ljubljana. Uh, but one thing to note there, Ljubljana, Slovenia has a population of about 2.1 million. Slovenia has got a population of about 200,000. So it hasn't got that many people, but what they have got is quite intact ecological um, uh, networks within their city. Looking at, but looking at the metrics that this study did, London actually fared pretty poorly. So it came almost to the bottom. You can see it there. Uh, Brussels was only below it. Um, and that probably is part of um, a part of that is because of London's size and scale uh, you know almost nine million people it has a lot of anthropogenic pressures on it but as, I, as Ben mentioned a lot of our work is in London and we we testify the point that London actually is full and our urban areas are full of wildlife if you look at London it's about 49.5 percent green space it's got over 16,000 species recorded in it. So actually, in terms of an ecological system, it's more diverse than some of our national parks that we have in the UK, some of our 15 national parks. It's probably an indictment of, of those national parks to some extent, but um, it just shows you urban environments can actually have incredible amounts of wildlife, from bird species to invertebrate species to mammal species. So, and we, and we think, rewilding people is at the heart of our projects. So we want to make people aware of the, that wildlife that currently exists in that urban realm, and then help how we, how we can work together and create a wilder, more functional landscape. Thanks, Ben. If we can just go to the next slide. Um, so a really important thing to recognize, 84% of people in the UK currently live in the urban environment. So that is important for many reasons. One, because what do we want our urban environments to be? Do we want them to be lifeless, sort of grey deserts that can't harbour much in the way of life and are not resilient to, to climate change? Or do we want to embrace living systems in these urban spaces and try and make them as ecologically healthy as possible 
which will one, obviously improve our resilience to climate change for mitigating flood risk, controlling the urban island heating effect, to um, improving the quality of our air, uh, to sequestering more carbon. We know that we know that functional ecological systems bring these ecological ecosystem services. So why not try and embrace them? But more importantly, as we have the vast majority of the population living in these spaces, we want to connect these people to these uh, these, uh, these these natural these natural wonders, and where better to do it than on their doorsteps, where they can be inspired on their daily walks and actually feel a connection to nature, not something that they maybe feel every few weeks or so when they go off into the countryside, but actually something they physically live alongside and a part of, and viewing wildlife as part of the wider community to which they belong to. So that hopefully gives you an insight to how we define rewilding. Um, ben, do you want to jump on? Yeah, sure. Thanks for that idea. Um, cool. So just going to run through, yeah, all of our projects that we're working on. Um, so the first of which being our Get Involved project. So excuse the pun, but this is our urban waterfall reintroduction project, uh, working on a tributary of the Thames called the Hogs Mill, which is a chalk stream. Uh, about 10 kilometers in length, um, where as of last month, the end of last month, we released about over 100 waterfalls back onto the river, um, where they'd been locally extinct since 2017. Um, only around about 30 years ago, um, the river was teeming with waterfalls, and it does have kind of a nice heritage in terms of its history with uh, waterfalls. So the reason I'm showing this painting here on the left, uh, which you can see here, is a painting by uh, Millet called Ophelia. Um, and this painting was actually painted down on the Hogsmill River. Um, and it's a really good snapshot of, of what the river looked like in, in the 19th century. So you can see some, some classic riverine species um, there. Excuse my uh, doorbell going off there. Um, so you can see some classic riverine species here. It's a good snapshot of what the river would have looked like. Um, at the time. But what's really interesting in particular about uh, this painting is that actually in the top right, if you and when they've looked at it under x-rays, is you can actually see a water vol, um, a water vol actually on um, underneath on, on the x-rays. So it just shows that at the time of the painting in the 19th century, um, water vols are very much part of the landscape and were included. But sadly, um, under um, recommendations by his contemporaries at the time um, and his yeah, contemporaries as part of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood paint of painters, uh, he was recommended to get rid of the waterfall because it looked too much like a rat, which is a real shame, um, but just goes to show the kind of heritage of waterfalls um, on the Hogsmill River. But, um, but in terms of more recently, so in 2017, um, they went locally extinct, um, which is emblematic of the wider decline of water voles across the country. Um, so recent uh, surveys and, and uh, research is showing that there's uh, estimated to only be around 77,000 water voles across the UK um, when they should be found in their millions. This is primarily due to uh, well, it's, it's part of wider declines uh, because of habitat degradation, so things like culverting, um, canalisation and pollution. Um, but more recently, over the past few decades, um, because of the presence of invasive American mink, uh, which predate heavily upon waterfalls um, across the country. So population of around about 77,000, it really is on um, kind of precipice of extinction. So that's why reintroduction projects like this are so important. So we kickstarted the project back in 2019 um, and we really wanted to put a key focus on how do we get local people involved um, with that reintroduction project. So it started with the training and upskilling of around 60 volunteers um, to actually go out and survey the entire um, 10 kilometre catchment of the river looking for viable habitat for a reintroduction. Um, and then we, we were able to grade that, um, which is what you can see on this map here. So green being the best habitat um, in terms of a potential reintroduction. Um, after conducting this, we found about a two and a half kilometer stretch, um, which you can see around about here, of viable habitat, um, which we chose as our reintroduction site, um, but also because we chose that site because it was indeed where the last water bowl was seen back in 2017. Um, so it kind of made sense in terms of um, where we'd choose for that reintroduction. But after kind of getting that excellent engagement of people getting involved with the project, we really wanted to work out how we could kind of harness that people power and make sure they stay involved uh, with the project long term. 
So the way that we did that was to, we created different uh, project teams. So to kind of um, line up with people's specific areas of interest. So for example, we've got a habitat restoration team. So this is a team of volunteers that come out on a regular basis, taking part in various uh, river restoration projects. So anything from uh, litter picking right through to removing Himalayan balsam. Um, and we actually, over the past two years, we've planted well over a thousand um, uh, native river plants and waterfall food back on the river. Um, and we've had lots of volunteers involved with this to date. Um, and we're gonna continue doing this restoration work uh, post-release as well. We've also got a team of around about 25 volunteers who are going out on a weekly basis, um, surveying the river, looking for signs of invasive American mink. Um, so we've got 10 of these floating rafts, which you can see here, which are deployed um, at intervals across the catchment. Um, each raft is equipped with a small clay pad, um, which is picking up footprints of any mammals or any animals that are, any animals that are moving a walk over the top. We have pairs of volunteers that are going out to check each raft on a weekly basis, looking at these footprints um, and then any suspicious ones that we think could, could well be American mink. We deploy a camera trap um, to confirm presence or absence. And using that methodology, we've, we've uh, been doing this for about three years and we've only had one confirmed sighting of mink on the river, which has been really positive. Obviously, with now the release going ahead, it's more likely we will get mink uh, coming to the river. So we've kind of upped our protocol to um, have include uh, uh, actual floating mammal traps as well um, so that we can yeah, um, deploy our mink protocol ongoing. And again, this is utilizing volunteer power as well. Um, we've also set up a community engagement team. So this is people who want to get involved with local events um, or kind of school engagement, family engagement, um, or going out or just generally raising the profile of the project more broadly. Um, and also last year we launched um, a dog walker engagement program. Um, so this is not only to engage dog walkers with the project, but also engage them about how to um, walk their dogs responsibly amongst amongst wildlife, which we think is going to be really, really beneficial um, for both waterfowls, but also uh, wildlife more broadly out on the Hogsmill River um, and hopefully further afield as well. So uh, at the end of this month, we're going to be running our first um, wild walking day. So we're getting dog walkers out um, on a nature walk to teach them about some of the issues that can occur between uh, dogs and wildlife and also how you can overcome some of those problems as well. Um, and then finally, we actually, we set up a fundraising team as well. So this is a team of volunteers who basically wanna help us with any fundraising initiatives we have. So researching potential grant funding opportunities, um, but also actually helping us run our crowdfunder campaign, um, which raised over 18,000 pounds at the end of 2020 um, and actually paid for the water bowls themselves. So all of this work has really been, a, you know, has come to fruition in the past month or so, um, when we actually released 101 water bowls back onto the river. Um, this one you can see here coming out of its release pen um, just two weeks ago. So it's really exciting, um, but it's by no means the uh, the end of the project. It's very much, we see this as very much the, the beginning. So we'll be con continuing with our restoration work ongoing. Um, but we've also got a whole suite of different post uh, monitoring, uh, post release monitoring going on. So series of camera traps, which we've trained volunteers to use and analyze that data. We are experimenting with bioacoustic sensors um, to record for waterfall sounds as well as other wildlife on the river. And again, we've got volunteers helping with that. And then also more, um, more traditional survey methodologies such as latrine rafts. So putting out floating rafts on the river, um, looking for signs of uh, waterfall feces so that we can confirm presence or absence. Um, and yeah, overall, it's been a, a hugely successful project and we've had well over 350 people engaged um, to date and around about 30 people joining a monthly call each week to discuss project activities and updates um, and help plan for future activities as well. So this project, um, it's slightly further afield, it's, it's less urban focused, but can be used very much as a template um, for the urban setting and how you engage local people. So this is called A Hop of Hope, um, and it focuses on a speech, uh, species called the uh, Large Marsh Grasshopper, which is the UK's largest species of grasshopper, um, but it's also our rarest. So it was once found throughout the entirety of the south of England, um, where it could be found in uh, valley mires, uh, bogs, peat bogs, 
um, and our fens, but as we've either degraded these habitats or destroyed them completely, they've been much from, uh, lost from much of our landscape. Um, and as of 2018, they were only found in three pockets um, in the southwest of England, including the New Forest and two sites um, further afield in Dorset and Hampshire. Um, and so this project is really about um, empowering local people to actually um, be part of a reintroduction project to re-establish their population throughout their previous geographical range. So the way that we run this um, is that the, the core project team each year goes out to the New Forest, um, where we survey various sites uh, for largemouth grasshoppers. Um, and with permissions from Natural England and the Forestry Commission, we actually collect every one in 10 individuals that we, we find there, um, and we use them, them as part of a captive rearing uh, programme. So each year we then subsequently recruit volunteers. So on average, we have, have around about between 10 and 15 volunteers a year who we provide training for um, and all the equipment to actually home rear grasshoppers at home. So each June we'll run a training session um, on, how, on grasshopper husbandry. Um, we'll then have a collection day where people will collect all of their um, locust cages or vivariums, the technical word, um, all of the equipment. So things like the Petri dish here, which you can see is full of egg pods. So each of these egg pods contains around about 10 uh, grasshopper eggs. Um, and then we've got uh, we will have volunteers going out on a daily basis collecting grass um, to feed to their hungry hoppers um, as they grow. And over the next two months, they'll be rearing them at home, growing them to adult size. And then we run two release days um, into various sites across Norfolk. Um, so these are on to, uh, onto restored peat bogs um, yeah, throughout, the, throughout the county. Um, and this is a photo on the left here is one of our long term uh, citizen keepers, as we call them, um, who's been rearing grasshoppers for us for a few years. Um, and then on the right hand side, we've actually got a photo here of our non exec director, Pamela, um, alongside Tony Juniper, the head of Natural England, who came out for a release day earlier in the year. And it's been a, an incredibly um, effective way of actually scaling up a reintroduction project. So. We've had around 30 volunteers involved over four years, and they've helped us home rear and release just under 4,000 individuals back into the wild. Um, so it really just goes to show how yeah, getting volunteer power um, in their homes in a very simple methodology can actually um, be really effective in terms of your outputs. Um, and yeah, we're, we're starting to see signs of self-sustaining populations across those reintroduction sites. Um, and we've done this into four different locations. And as of next year, we're hoping to um, put them into a further two, taking us to six, which would be a major achievement. Um, now, whilst obviously this is quite a rural focused project, uh, one thing to point out is that we have had people living in London get involved with the projects um, and actually home rearing in London, taking their grasshoppers actually on the tube, on the train over to, over to Norfolk, where we've released them back into the wild. Um, but one thing we're really keen to do is actually use this as a template um, for other species. So thinking about species here in London that are on the, de on the decline um, and how we could replicate this model, getting local people involved with home rearing um, for reintroductions. So one species we're currently looking at um, is the common lizard um, and looking at restored sites where we could possibly reintroduce them, uh, which is really exciting. Um, so this project here, this is very, this sits under our kind of broader theme of rewilding people more specifically. Um, so this is Edith Gardens. It's a small nature reserve in Surbiton in Kingston, um, southwest London. It's just under half a hectare, so it is small in size. Um, and we have restored this to be the borough's really only fully accessible nature reserve. Um, so it is designed for either disabled people or people suffering with their mental health who may not otherwise be uh, want to access other green spaces around the borough. Um, it's designed for people, yeah, people to come and enjoy the space and, and learn about the local wildlife um, on their doorstep. Just in terms of a bit of background, it's got quite a, an interesting history. So in World War II, it was actually used as an air raid shelter. Um, it was then an allotment site for a couple of decades um, in the second half of the century. And then in 1992, it was, it was uh, put as a local nature reserve um, and has had on-off management over the years. But after years of neglect, we took on the site in 2018. Um, the first thing we had to do was clear it of around about six tonnes worth of rubbish and rubble, which had been fly-tipped onto the site. 
Um, as part of our funding from the local council, uh, we put in a wheelchair friendly path. Um, we also put in new habitat features. So we've got a, wildlife, a new wildlife pond on site. We've put a solitary bee bank in um, a new young hedgerow, a dead hedge around the perimeter, just to give it a slight barrier to some of the uh, adjacent gardens. Also put in a small woodland as well, um, and have just generally been keep, uh, carrying out habitat restoration over the past couple of years, which has eventually led us to, well, what the core goal really for the site was, so to use it as an ecotherapy site. So on the left hand side here, you can see one of our ecotherapy sessions with the local branch of MIND, um, getting out some of their, their clients to come and experience the space, learn about the wildlife on their doorstep and ways that they can get involved um, with the restoration of the, of the, of the site uh, more broadly and also ways they can get involved with Citizen Zoo as well um, and yeah, our other projects. Uh, on, the, on the right hand side here, uh, it's just a photo from a workshop we did with the Kingston Centre for Independent Living, um, where we again we had some of their clients coming out just to, to learn about the space, and we did a, a nature walk around the site, um, just to show what we'd done and, and yeah engage people that way. Um, whilst this is kind of still its infancy in terms of running these ecotherapy sessions, there's quite a lot of appetite in terms of renewing them, and it's something that we're really looking to explore so that we can expand our work um, engaging engaging people um, with need of gardens. And I will now hand back to Elliot. Thanks, Ben. Um, so I'm now going to take you through a few other, one of our few other projects that we're currently working on. Again, all have community at the heart, but they, they, they're, they're, they're varied in their context. Uh, and one thing that we've been working on very closely, which actually Plymouth for one of the first um, urban environments in the whole of the UK to really push this agenda forward is looking at beavers within the urban landscape. Um, and actually, a few, well, a few years ago or so, we had a lot of discussions with Jerry Griffiths, who, who was running the, the Plymouth Beaver reintroduction site. It was great to learn from him and see the, how, how the Plymouth project uh, progressed and, 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 and the learnings that have been taken from that project. But for those who don't know, beavers are well, an incredible species. And there are species that went extinct in the UK about 400 years ago for two main reasons. Um, one was they were shot for their fur because uh, they've got incredibly dense fur. And uh, secondly, they were shot for their castorium, which is what they secrete out of their anal glands to mark their territories. And because beavers love eating things like willow, uh, you get something called saprocytic acid in that. And that means that the castorium had very basic medicinal properties similar to that of aspirin. So they were, they were heavily persecuted until their extinction about 400 years ago. But as I'm sure many of you are aware, in recent years, beavers have been on a real comeback in the, in the, U, in the UK. And we're hoping for October the 1st this year, in English legislation, beavers should be once again recognised as a native and protected species within the English context, which is great, sort of following Scottish progression. Scottish policy, which has been progressing over the last sort of 20 years or so. But how does this refer to the urban landscape? How does this make, how does this refer to people? And there's two, there's two ways in which we're, 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 we're doing this. So if you look across Europe, if you look across North America, there are many settings in which beavers are prevalent within the urban landscapes. If you look at Berlin, they've got about, well, they've got about, uh, 70 beavers living north, north uh, in northern Berlin. Uh, the police recently came out to it and said that they are welcome within, within the, 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 that context. Also, you look across Bavaria, Munich's got high numbers of beavers. If you look into places like Vancouver in, uh, uh, in North America, uh, yeah, in Canada, um, you've got beavers living at the heart of the urban environment there, right in the Olympic Village. So we know that beavers can survive and thrive with an urban context surrounded by high dense conurbations of people. And obviously beavers being the ecosystem engineers that they are, they help secure and unleash a whole wealth of, of ecosystem services, such as cleaning our water, reducing flood risk, improving biodiversity, but also inspiring people. So to that vein, what we've done, we've now set up the London Beaver Working Group. And that works across London. We work with the Wildlife Trust here in London. We work with the Environment Agency, Natural England, but loads of NGOs, lots of local authorities. 
and we're looking at we're, we're doing we're leading two things in that sense we recognize in kent which obviously neighbors london that there's about 300 living free living beavers there at the moment and there's an ex expanding wild population there's also in oxfordshire an expanding wild population so we recognize that beavers are going to recolonize the thames within london in probably the next 10 years if not if not sooner so we want to be prepared for that eventuality from both a social and a matter of ecological management perspective so uh, we've created this group and we're just sort of prepared we're, we're helping to develop plans what will happen if we want beavers recolonize um, our urban environment naturally but also we want to demonstrate how amazing beavers can be within the urban landscape how they can inspire local people and really we should as, as people be able to live alongside beavers quite happily in an urban landscape if we manage them appropriately so we've then been working across London, identifying sites. We're working with a great organization called the Beaver Trust um, uh, and identifying sites, which we think could be demonstration sites where could, which can show how we can live alongside beavers in the urban landscape. But we do that through a reintroduction and an enclosure. So we've identified a fantastic site in Ealing, quite aptly known as Paradise Fields. Uh, and this is a 10 hectare site. Uh, and we're, we're having lots of meetings with Natural England and the Environment Agency at the moment. We're hoping to get our A05 license imminently, which will enable us to do our reintroduction. And what this will be, it'll be relatively pioneering in the sense that this will be a fully immersive enclosure. So this will be an enclosure that people will be able to walk into and actually see, see what it's like to live alongside beavers in an urban realm. So there won't be, there'll be a fence that because it's part of a, a public right of way, we have to enable access to this site. So to get through in our, over the last sort of year or so, we've been doing incredible amounts of community consultation. We've got a live consultation. We just had hundreds of responses asking what people feel about live, potentially us doing a beaver reintroduction in a very urban environment. Just to give you some context, even though it looks like a really great naturalistic site in that picture that you can see on the right there, and it is a great site, just the other side of the carriageway there is a big industrial park with McDonald's, so it's in a very heavily urbanised location. So we've been going to local people and just saying, well, how would you feel about living alongside beavers? And actually, we've been, it's, the response has been incredibly, incredibly positive. The only uh, issues that have been raised really are from an animal welfare perspective, asking will the beavers be able to live here? And we've been doing lots of feasibility analysis with the Beaver Trust, looking at modelling the habitat using Exeter University's uh, 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 research departments who've been incredibly supportive. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so we've modelled the site from a feasibility perspective and we've demonstrated there's actually optimal habitat effectively for beavers there, which really is great. So, um, and then also in the run up, we've been doing lots of talks and walks, getting local people out, getting them excited about the site. So this is even prior to us securing our license. So we now effectively have hundreds of people working very closely with the Eden Wildlife Group, who are very excited about beavers already. And, we, and, and, and we're really looking forward to hopefully welcoming beavers to the site if all goes to plan next year. Um, to, to to really be that sort of demonstration how we can live alongside beavers but of course this will represent challenges as well ben has already mentioned the dog walking work streams that we have um, so there'll be lots of work that we do with dog walkers within this environment to make sure that pose no real threat to beavers one thing that beavers do that the main reason that they sort of flood areas is actually due to their sort of predation fear from wolves so most of their behavior is actually about trying to avoid interactions with people and dogs. So we're quite confident having a 10 hectare site, they'll be able to protect themselves. I mean, lots of water on site. There'll be lots of areas where they can seek refuge that pretty much aren't very accessible by either dogs or people. Um, so we're really confident that it will be a fantastic demonstration and we look forward to updating you further when, 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 as that project progresses. Um, great, Ben, can you jump to the next slide? So another element of our working is how we can try and look at larger landscapes. So obviously that 10 hectare enclosure for the beavers is a large landscape for an urban setting. But we're now looking at a slightly larger setting here, which is about 42 hectares, um, which is a, the largest nature reserve that we have access to in sort of southwest London in the Kingston area. And what we want to do here 
it's already a nature reserve, but we want to demonstrate how this could potentially be um, a wilder space that could really implement and demonstrate rewilding principles in the sense of ecological processes and utilizing analog species, trying to uh, uh, emulate sort of Pleistocene fauna, such as the oryx and tarpan and wild boar that used to, used to inhabit our landscapes and which obviously were a very important part of our ecosystem. So what we're doing here, we're, gonna, we're using learnings from sites such as the Nep Estate, Wild Ken Hill, Rewilding Coombs Head, which isn't too far from you guys, um, and seeing how can we try and actually create a rewilding reserve within a very urbanized landscape. So this is a project that is currently funded by the Greater London Authority, the London Mayor, and we're very much in year one of this project. So we're looking at the feasibility, what can we do, what is possible? And there's free work streams associated with this project. Um, ben, can you jump to the next slide? Because I think that's the one with the... Um, so the most important thing that we're trying to... Well, one of the most important things here, and I would just say it's important with any ecological project. Indeed, we're doing it with the Beaver project now, but it's making sure we have a very robust ecological baseline. So we can demonstrate what the site is like in its current condition, and how any interventions that we do moving forward will change the, the fauna, the flora, the ecological processes that are currently inhabiting that site for better or for worse. So we can really monitor the impacts of our actions. That's not to say that we're going to be managing it with a desired outcome for a particular species, but we do want to make sure we're monitoring robustly to make sure that we can identify any changes to take place. Ben very well described the post-release monitoring that we're currently doing for our water bowls. We, we really, we really think post monitoring is essential to any conservation tool from an ecological sense. I'll talk about social senses in a second. And the way in which we're doing an ecological baseline for this site, there's three ways in which we're, we're doing this. Um, one way is we're doing it from a traditional way, from a traditional sense, working with nationally recognised invertebrate experts and botanists to do uh, a UK hab. Uh, classification of the site, looking at an, an MVC model to get all those the sort of floral, floral um, uh, plants that are uh, doing transex to look at our sort of floral communities that we've got on site and are the invertebrates that are currently inhabiting the site um, uh, to get sort of a typical robust baseline that you would see when you typically engage sort of ecologists. So that is our, 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 the first, our first way in which we're doing our ecological baseline. The second way in which we're doing our ecological baseline is uh, using technology as much as we can. Uh, this is a fantastic organisation called Carbon Rewild, and this is a, a demonstration of one of the outputs that they've done. And we've effectively deployed five bioacoustic sensors around the site for a period of a month, and they were just listing out the various sort of bird species that we're using the site. So it's a good way of us trying to get um, a species composition list uh, of presence uh, and we think it actually worked very well and that's actually a really cool organization what they do they can actually post you the bioacoustic sensors through the post you get them you put them up for a month you send them back and then they send you the analysis so it's actually a really quite cool and efficient way of doing um, eco bioacoustic uh, survey work and it means you haven't got to worry about the analysis working with things like the BTO pipeline and stuff like that it, it, it makes it quite a streamlined way of doing things we're also deploying wildlife cameras across the site in a network to get to demonstrate that change. But most importantly, our third scheme in which we're um, surveying the site from an ecological perspective is with the community, embedding the community at the start of this project in the ecological survey. So luckily the site has a huge barn on it. Um, we, uh, a church was getting renovated a few years ago and the, the pews were going to go to waste. So we said, can we borrow them? Can we borrow them? Can we take the pews to save them? And they said, yes. So now we have almost like an outdoor lecture theatre in which we can run training workshops. Um, so every month, working with the Field Studies Council, we do field recording days. Um, we've been doing this since April, and we'll be doing it until November, where one day a month we invite um, the national recorder down for various, for various taxonomic groups. On this day, we, who's photographed here, you've got Mike, who's the, uh, rec who's the uh, UK recorder for ants, and Meg, who's the UK recorder for harvestmen. 
and we spent the day looking for ants and harvestmen. And on that day, public are invited to meet these experts, go around, and we just spend the day surveying for those particular taxonomic groups. Um, and it's a great way to introduce people to surveying methods, to the, 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 the fascination of that particular group. And we, we, we're typically getting about 20 to 30 people on these sessions of the month, which is, which is great because that managed to scale up our effort. Uh, and we were doing this across a broad spectrum of taxonomic groups from, from hoverflies to, to earthworms, mainly with, a, with um, a sort of invertebrate focus on those days. But we're also working with local bird groups and doing bird walks to look at the sort of bird fauna with, with, their, with their local interest groups and also doing bat walks, which have been very well attended. We had about, about 50 people, I think, on our last bat walk, which was great. Uh, so we, it's about embedding local people in that ecological monitoring to make them feel that they're part of the project from the very start and also to help top skill them. And we're getting a lot of students who are coming in as well, who are affiliated with local colleges. And, and so they are um, making sure that they're, they're part of the project and also getting some learning out, out of it. And maybe that will help them progress in their career moving forward. So that is our stuff. That's how we're trying to take our ecological baseline and we're sort of emulating a similar process with our beaver site at the moment. Um, but I can't stress enough how much that baseline is important. But it's not just the ecological baseline that we're trying to assess this year. It's very much the social baseline too. So this is a site that is surrounded by developments effectively. It's got new developments, about 800 homes being built very close to it as we speak. Um, and it's in one of the more deprived areas of southwest London. So prior to starting the project, one of our um, project partners is called the Community Brain, who specialise in doing community engagement activities using arts, effectively using mainly the arts to uh, get people excited about the space in which they live. And they actually conducted a survey, uh, a community survey of the site to 3,000 people who effectively lived on the doorstep of this beautiful nature reserve. And only 5% of the people who were surveyed, out of the 3,000 people who were surveyed, even knew the site existed and were visiting. So it really demonstrated there is a real dearth of engagement going on in these urban spaces, which we think can be improved to the benefit of, of, of public well-being. That's probably, that, that's almost certainly changed since the lockdown pandemic, as more people have gone out to explore their local environments. But we think, uh, but, but, um, well, but we know that these sites are important, but what we're trying to do now is just now work with communities as much as we can to get them embedded into this site. So apart from the ecological investigations that the community are helping with, we run regular talks. For example, next month, we booked out a local theatre where people come to learn and hear about the progression of what's been going on. We've done that a few times already this year. We're working with local schools to get them out on site. We even, uh, the part of the project team, we had a flower we had a, sh a show garden at the Hampton Court flower show this year which was demonstrating the wildlife of the site and how wildlife can actually inspire creativity and music and we had a, a comp composer uh, uh, conduct some amazing musical um, well, an amazing song effectively that was actually using the bird song that had been recorded from the site so it's trying to use multiple different ways in which we can reach out to communities that might not typically be interested in doing ecological surveys but trying to find other hooks such as the arts to try and get them involved so um, we've also got this sort of community baseline survey so we're, so we're now surveying people this year about how they're using the site and what they would like to see the site become so 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 really important baselines from both an ecological side and a, and a community side and so we're also engaging with conservation experts uh, to try and see what sort of interventions we can do at this site and what's feasible. For example, we're looking at wetland creation, we're looking at grazing models, we're looking at white stalks, we're looking at glowworms, we're looking at a whole range of species that we think could be really amazing that would help contribute to the, the biodiversity richness of the site, but also the ecological processes so by the end of next year we'll have this plan that is a co-designed vision based on strong ecology robust community engagement and feasibility analysis with various conservation leaders and demonstrate how we think we can turn this site into london's best rewilding reserve uh, so yeah we're at the early stages of the journey but it's an incredibly important part of the journey uh, thanks ben 
Um, and then the last project I'm going to talk to you about is, again, back to uh, similarly to the third project that Ben spoke to you about, about our, how we rewild people. So we've, we've um, got a working relationship with the local carers network and, we, and uh, we specifically the young carers. So these are children aged between eight and 15 who are typically the primary caregiver in their home for whatever reason. And it's, well, it's very humbling to see how many children are actually part of that program. And these are children who um, obviously got a lot of day-to-day -day stresses on. And um, uh, so we, we, we've created a program with them, which is funded by Children in Need, uh, where we uh, offer respite and educational experiences in the natural world. And it's a three-year program. And how, what we do, we take children out to some of our nature reserves, take them on nature walks, try and open their, open their eyes to the wonderful world of biodiversity that they can literally walk to, which is very close proximity to their homes. So and it's great to see them out engaged in pond dipping, doing bat walks, doing um, all sorts of bird watching and yeah, uh, going to see, for example, we, when we get cattle on some of our sites, going to see the cattle. Uh, that those sort of things just to get the children excited about the natural world and just demonstrate that there is an interest there that they, they might not have had access to previously but another really important part of this project is that the natural history museum in london and every year we uh well we we, 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 we conduct where well, we trips to the museum and they don't just go to the museum to walk around like you would as if you're just accessing the site as a normal visitor uh we've got a very close relationship with the museum and they're very kindly um give us a behind the scenes tour of all these children so what you can see in the in the right hand picture there is oliver crimmen who's probably the the national most regarded fish expert that we have in the uk he's the creator of fish the natural history museum and he on this occasion he gave us a personal tour of the spirit room and this is one of the most amazing rooms in the natural history museum it doesn't have public access one of the cabinets is just full of all the specimens that Charles Darwin brought back from his adventures on the Beagle. But more, well, what the children find more interesting are these big tanks that are normally closed, but we open these tanks up. And as you can see what Oliver's doing there, you think he's got the head of a sturgeon or, or might be, a, I think that's a sturgeon, but also sharks. And they also have things like um, angel, uh, ang angle, anglerfish. Um, incredible specimens that aren't normally accessible to the public and these children get to see what it is to be a scientist and maybe and, and some of them have now got a new newfound interest in the natural world and maybe that might um, not only be a bit of respite for them to get away from their stresses and strains their daily life but also provide them some inspiration for something they might want to pursue when they grow up but it really is a fantastic project and the feedback we've had from the children is amazing um, Ben I'll pass back over to you Cool, thanks, Elliot. Um, so the next few examples are just some other projects that are going on uh, here in London, um, which yeah, hopefully will be relevant to the kind of Plymouth uh, setting as well. So the first one um, is a London Wildlife Trust project. Um, it sits within their kind of uh, living landscapes program. Um, so it focuses on remnants of the Great North Wood, uh, which is an, an ancient woodland that was once spanning, uh, once spanned the entirety of South London. Um, and it's working to enhance, restore, connect up, and also raise the profile um, of all those remaining pockets of woodland throughout South London. Um, it does this through various ways, um, in, including a kind of rest ongoing restoration days, um, but also taking part in um, kind of citywide uh, initiatives such as London Tree Week um, to get local people involved um, and again like raising the profile of those sites. Um, <clears throat> it's currently working on around about 28 pockets of woodland across South London. Um, one notable one being Sydenham Hillwood uh, which I think is the, is the largest uh, remaining patch of ancient woodland in South London. Um, it's famous yeah for, for obviously this woodland habitat but it's also got this incredible disused railway line, um, which has now become uh, a bat roost um, and kind of showcases that um, the way in which yeah, wildlife can take back over on a kind of urban landscape. Um, it's a really amazing uh, woodland to go into. Um, but they've, they've dovetailed that, that project really nicely with um, another of their projects called Keeping It Wild. 
um, which has a specific remit of engaging underrepresented groups in conservation um, with the project. So particularly young people from 11 to 25 years of age, um, or people from ethnic minority backgrounds, um, or people from low income communities. Um, and through that project, they actually, they have, um, I think three sets of, of internships each year, um, where they recruit young people um, and, and upskill them on various woodland management techniques um, through the Great, Great North Wood Project. Um, and it's been a really successful way for yeah, getting under, underrepresented groups involved. Um, and they've had about, about over a, th a thousand people um, involved with the project since um, beginning in around about 2017. So, yeah, it's been a it's been a great project for them. Um, and it shows case is a really good way of getting local people um, from underrepresented, un underrepresented groups involved in conservation. Um, I know Plymouth Council are doing something fairly similar in terms of the latest work on uh, tree canopy um, surveys and looking at ways to enhance that. Um, so again, maybe this project could provide some sort of inspiration for how that could be um, developed further down the line. Um, so these next couple of, couple of examples are very much thinking about um, river landscapes and how they've changed in particular to, to London. Um, but obviously this is more emblematic of rivers across the country, um, obviously suffering from things like canalisation, culverting, and particularly in our urban areas, um, even being undergrounded. So you can see here all of the, the dark blue dotted lines. Um, these can indicate um, rivers in London or tributaries of the Thames, which are, are no longer above ground and they've been put underground within the urban area. Um, obviously that can lead to a number of um, issues, uh, but one great example of kind of a community engagement campaign um, that has helped to improve the habitat um, and imp improve things like flooding in the local area um, was carried out by the Quaggy Working Group, uh, Quaggy Working Action Group. Um, so this was a small portion of the Ravensbourne River um, that flows through Bromley and Greenwich and Lewisham. Um, which was undergrounded um, and there was about an eight-year campaign by the local community uh, to improve the, the landscape by uh, reinstating natural meanders um, but also reinstating flood meadows to, to help with flood alleviation and also in a park called Sutcliffe Park actually daylighting the river once again um, and the, the results have been quite astounding actually in terms of local engagement so a recent survey found that found that 83% of respondents um, felt positively about the project and the impacts in terms of flood alleviation in the local area have obviously been um, um, pretty positive as well. Um, and in terms of biodiversity bounce back as well, obviously there's been some great outcomes there. So that's overall been a really positive project and just showcases how community action can make a big difference in terms of river, river restoration work. An example of a project where um, actually daylighting is not actually possible um, is on the, the River Ephra, which you can see here, which partly runs through Hearn Hill, obviously a very urbanized area close to Brixton, um, which in the past has suffered from floods, um, flooding events. So in 2004, 2012, it flooded heavily uh, where the undergrounded river actually burst, burst its so-called bank. So coming up through the sewers, um, flooding local residential areas as well as retail areas. One of the ways that they've looked to combat this is through a, another London Wildlife Trust project, uh, which was launched a few years back called the Lost Ephra Project. And whilst it's not looking to daylight any of the rivers or reinstate any natural meanders or anything along those lines, it's looking at proactive solutions within an urban setting to actually combating um, and alleviating flooding. So, for example, they've worked with housing associations to put in things like rain gardens, um, which can soak up a lot of water, stopping some of that runoff going down to, to the um, underground rivers. But also they've removed around about 110 metres squared of concrete as well and are replacing with green infrastructure to, to, again, to soak up some of that water. I think one of the great things about this project as well is the community engagement. So, as I said, working with housing associations on their land also putting in things like green roofs, um, and they also gave out water butts as well. So a great way of storing water and also reducing the amount of water that's going out onto the 
concrete and ending up back into those underground rivers. So again, just a great way of getting local people involved in, in proactive solutions to, to some of these issues. Um, and I know, I think there's a project uh, under the Green Mines project as well, which is working on the Central Park um, Park in Plymouth, uh, where I think they're doing something similar with su sustainable drainage, drainage systems, putting in a series of ponds that can um, obviously absorb water and slowing it down through small weirs and dams. So again, obviously stuff, work like this is being replicated within the Plymouth area, which is, is great to see. And I'll hand over to Elliot. Thanks, Ben. Um, so we're starting to get to the end of our examples now, but now the examples that I'm going to tell you about are in more sort of traditional settings that um, I know Plymouth are looking at at the moment, but the examples I'm going to give you is where, where, where I live. Um, but the, the methodology is, is, it can be very similar. And this is how that we can try and maximise the ecological value of our roadside verges, which is very much publicly discussed within the council arenas at the moment, and also our raised bed planting. So, for example, where I live in Kingston, we've developed two new schemes um, for our roadside verges and our raised beds. Um, our, our roadside verges is entitled Wildways, and this is based on the methodology of Dr. Phil Sterling, who actually used to work at Dorset Council, I believe and is how you can try and maximize the wildflower value of our roadside verges, which obviously represents a significant amount of land if you added it all up. Obviously the best way when you're trying to manage a wildflower verge or, or, or trying to improve wildflowers, you have to think about the composition of the soil. It's all about the nitrate and the phosphate levels. If you have a high, if you have a highly loaded system in terms of no nutrients and nitrates, that will make it a very competitive environment and therefore things like coarse grasses will overtake the landscape and will not give any opportunities for wildflowers to express themselves. One way of trying to combat that, which is quite an expensive way of combating that, is removing the top 10 centimetres of topsoil, exposing a poor nutrient soil below it, um, and then that will then be a better, more conducive environment for wildflowers to prosper, hopefully. However, that, that, that requires significant labour in terms of removing the soil, disposing the soil, which is an, well, removing soil is a very economically and environmentally damaging um, <laughs> prospect because it's you know, lots, of, lots of soil is very heavy to move. And, you know, so um, the, the consequences of that are clear. So the way in which Dr. Phil Sterling suggested uh, uh, his methodology and one thing that has been adopted across councils and national road networks across the UK is still not as prevalent as I would like but it's definitely making more inroads is a cut and collect system and this is where over a period of time you cut the vegetation you take the vegetation away you cut the vegetation you take the vegetation away maybe in the first year doing that maybe three times in the second year maybe doing that two times but basically what you're trying to do is unload the nutrients from that system, taking out that vegetative matter so it doesn't fall onto the soil and then continue into that nutrient cycle. We want to remove it. And then if you successively continue to remove that, that, that vegetation, you start to sculpt the environment to create a more lower, well, a lower nutrient setting for these, environment, for these wildflowers to express themselves. So that's what Kingston are doing. Obviously, it's very difficult to do that on a broad scale because it's very... It, it does represent a change in contractual management. Um, a lot of green space contractors have managed these spaces for a long time. Um, so it does engender difficulties in terms of perceptions, not least the public, but also contractors. So one way in which the, we've adopted, the council in Kingston have adopted it is from a pilot based approach. So there's eight settings across the borough in which that new approach has been taken. And alongside that, there's lots of community engagement, um, which is telling local people about the process, the methodology behind the process, the issues that we've lost 97% of our wildflowers over since 1945, and trying to educate local people. And they all have, all of the little uh, wildways sites have a sign, which looks similar to the wildways sign here, the QR code, and that goes to a landing page which will have more information about the rationale for the project, but also 
an open consultation that people can do to let, their, let us know their views. And interestingly, most people who've conducted that are quite positive. However, I think that is a biased sample because a lot of people um, who maybe are less, less inclined for such a management style wouldn't wouldn't engage with that process and we have to recognize the bias within such a such 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 a technique like that um the second thing i want to tell you about is our bio beds and this is very simple uh, it's it's very frustrating when you see all these raised beds that it's covered in tufted grasses or or annual plants and don't have much in the way of wildlife value so all raised beds within the borough now have to follow three very basic rules one is it a food plant? Is it a larval host plant for a caterpillar of a butterfly species that's prevalent in the borough? If it is, it gets a tick and can be planted. Is it a pollinator friendly plant? And this is a plant that um, we, we categorize it very generally in terms of, is it on the RHS pollinator friendly list? If it is, it gets a tick. And then we want to make sure that we're planting a nectar source that's prevalent throughout the year. So looking at flowering seasons that are spring, summer and autumn, to prolong the amount of um, nectar sources as possible, but also that also provides an aesthetic appeal because you get different flowering times different year. So if it fulfills those two categories in terms of pollinator friendly and a bottle by food plant, it gets the tick, but also it needs to be robust in its management. Um, as many councils are, they're suffering cuts in, in, in budgets. So it has to be a hardy plant like Mediterranean plants, for example, that um, uh, can, can, they don't need much in the way of management, but uh, also have a wildlife and pollinator friendly sort of value. So very basic principles that can be communicated quite easily to contractors, um, but that is the approach in which it's been adopted now. And I think all, all councils can uh, are starting to move in that way. As I say, I know Plymouth Council are managing areas of rough grassland now, and they're adopting the, the areas uh, demonstrating areas, saying areas of rough grassland and saying that they're more flexible in the periods of time they cut them, but it's more in line with the, the natural cycle rather than just a, a typical um, date on a calendar in which the grass will be cut. It's, it's more, more in tune with the environment. But yeah, hopefully this is a way, and, but we deem that as rewilding within Citizen Zoo, turning these spaces that previously couldn't support much in a way of biodiversity to areas that can. Thanks, Ben. And the last one I want to tell you about is more in, term, in the realm of retrofitting. And this is something that can be quite uh, controversial in terms of is it what is the biodiversity value of these, uh, what, of these systems? Uh, for example, living roofs, living walls. Um, and uh, you know, are they are they a good way? Are they a good are they a good 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 effective use of money? And do they provide habitat? Do they provide ecosystem services? And there's a fantastic organisation. I, I promise you, we're not on the payroll of them, <laughs> but it's an organisation that we've come across that I think are actually very good. Um, and they they are sort of pioneering urban greening solutions. How you can convert the grey into actual biodiverse living systems. Um, so obviously they have their typical living wall systems, but actually something they do, they actually have tree walls. One big sort of uh, criticism of urban planting trees in the urban realm, especially on buildings, is that the roots, and you can't get that sort of saprosilic, I mean, uh, the mycorrhizal, sorry, um, interactions between um, uh, uh, the roots with, with fungi and stuff like that. But what they've actually created living root walls in which the whole is a textile membrane across the whole wall which enables the roots to actually move around the wall and interact as if it would be a more naturalistic setting and that was actually even though it's early days it was actually looking really interesting and coming with some really sort of promising results another one of their systems is actually looking at the typical lighting column um, in which they call them living pillars and you can see it here on the left hand side and this is where they retrofit or install a new a new bit of infrastructure where you can actually put greening systems on a on on a lamppost and effectively turn it into a a basic tree in some in some respects. They're self-irrigated, so they don't need much in the way of maintenance. Um, but I've seen we've seen images now. These are now popping up all across London. South Kensington's got them. Merton's got them, and I've seen images of birds 
actually nesting in lampposts, which is pretty incredible. So I think if we can look at these currently dead grey landscapes and see how can we try and turn them into living environments, that is a real way of rewilding our urban spaces. Um, ben, can you go on to the next slide, please? Actually, yeah, we'll come to that. So I think the first thing to say, I'll let you do a bit of summary as well, Ben, but um, just from, from, from myself, is just to say, hopefully those projects that we've just spoken about over the last hour really give you an insight to the, the projects that Citizen Zoo run and how rewilding can be applied within an urban setting. But hopefully you've also seen that community is at the heart of everything we do. They're embedded in our conservation projects, not just to the benefit of people who are engaging because it's a nice thing to do, but they really do add value. And whether this be from breeding or helping us rear grasshoppers to helping to survey for waterfall habitat or to help, or help us get baselines for, um, uh, for, for, for larger scale rewilding projects. So I hope that provided a good insight. Cool. Yeah, I Thanks. think that's it for me. Sorry, did you want to say something, Ben? No, no, I, I can, I'll hand back over to you. Okay, I'm just going to pause the... Okay, so uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, so now we've just got a sort of only not too many of us here, so I think we can have a chat. And Emily said you've already got some questions, haven't you? But I, I, re I just want to say I, I enjoyed finding out of all those amazing projects you're doing. I think it's really good, isn't it, to know what's going on in other places because you might see something that someone's done and go, oh, perhaps they can, uh, you know, get some information. You know, Mum was really happy to share information with people, but some of the things you mentioned I thought were really useful. So, yeah, I've got a few questions when other people have said their questions. So, Emily, did you have some questions? Did you well, want to I'll just ask one because I'm sure everyone's got lots, but... Um... Yeah, that was really useful, really interesting. Thanks, guys. There's so much there that's relevant to Plymouth and, and Exeter and other bits that we're trying to do around the county. So it's really useful. Thank you. Um, one of the ones that, well, a few of them resonated quite heavily with work I'm doing in Exeter, but one particularly, um, the work you're doing uh, around the Lost Rivers. Um, we're doing something slightly similar in Exeter uh, with a smaller with a small catchment and one of the biggest issues we're having is CSOs the uh, I have to look at my notes to remember what, it, how that, what that means combined sewer overflows uh, and trying to um, come up with options that aren't going to be completely destroyed by sewage at some point down the line I just wondered if you're having if you'd had similar issues uh, and how you dealt with them um, if you've been able to move them um, or if that's just something that's obviously not feasible yeah really good question emily um <clears throat> i suppose a lot of our work revolves around water courses whether it be water bowls or beavers or just general river restoration so obviously urbanized landscape we know the amount of outfalls out there that are potentially polluting and uh, and stuff like that i suppose we work as part of, depending on what project we work on, we're part of a partnership of organisations. For example, the Hogs Mill, we're part of the Hogs Mill Catchment Partnership there, which involves South East Water and Thames Water and the Environment Agency. So I suppose when we're looking at <coughs> Rectifar, well, you know, uh, the Environment Agency or Thames Water should be investigating various misconnections and outfalls and stuff like that. Um, and so we're, we're just more just encouraging the, 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 those those sort of processes to take place. Um, we get a lot of people asking us questions around, especially with the the recent press, which I think is well deserved around the sort of sewage going into our seas and rivers, and obviously less than two percent of our rivers really being in favourable condition, especially looking at sewage. So <clears throat> what we um, and, and is it is it is it ethical for us to put water bowls back into a system that is potentially compromised? Um, how we respond to that is, yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. But also that we need, we, we reckon that we go back to 1950, for example, the Thames was actually declared ecologically dead and there has been some progression in water quality since that point. There's different factors looking at heavy metals and stuff like that, but overall there has been some improvement and also some some steps back, but you know, the Thames now has about 125 species of fish living in it, and it had zero living in it in 1950. So that pretty much that's that shows there has been some improvements in water quality. 
But with water bowls and water quality, there's actually very limited research out there saying that water bowls are actually compromised by it, which is quite an interesting um, notion. And we think as, an, as a species that's on the brink of extinction, we need to really try and be rebuilding these ecosystems and uh, we're going to be monitoring. Similarly, the imp improvements that beavers bring to water quality is huge. And beavers, there's a lot of research demonstrating that beavers are tolerant to, to, to um, water quality uh, issues. And the, the wealth of research depicting how they improve water quality is, is, is impressive as well. So, um, yeah, I suppose we, so we're not, it's a long answer to, and I've gone off tangent, but I think we, we, we're not directly ever involved in the Thames Waters rectifying the Environment Agency, you know, or call the Environment Agency hotline if we have to, for example, we work very closely with the Environment Agency, but we, we don't actually in, involved in the solutions to sort of fix those issues. But we hope that beavers, and so we some water voles and habitat restoration will help to improve the condition of those rivers. Just, just quickly to add to that as well, one thing to point out as well, which is because we do work so closely with the community, obviously we do get a lot of issues relayed onto us from yeah, local, local volunteers. Um, and because we've got those kind of good working relationships with the wider catchment partnerships so on the Hogs Mill, um, you know, we have access to the Environment Agency in terms of water. It is quite a good platform to actually relay some of that kind of public opinion on. Obviously, I know they're probably getting it from hundreds of different directions in terms of, you know, social media and all the rest of it, but it's really good for us to kind of have that one-to-one -one engagement as well, um, just to say that this is what is being discussed locally, um, which hopefully I think is starting to, you know, is making a difference. Um, so yeah, that is, is one kind of benefit of having that kind of ingrained project that you can kind of be that voice um, for local people as well. Thank you, thank you. Any, anyone else? Um, Owen, hi Owen. <laughs> hi, hi everyone. Hi Elliot, hi Ben, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Yeah, it's really, really, really good. Um, I've got a mixture of comments and questions, I guess. Um, so- Owen, do you want to just say who, what your involvement is? with? Or oh what yeah. You work for? Sorry, yeah. I realise it's mostly council, isn't it? Sorry. So, um, I I'm a co-founder director of Pollinize, which is a pollinator conservation and community beekeeping organisation in Plymouth. So, and I've worked um closely with Helen on a few things in regards to green mines, and yeah, um, hope to continue working in that sort of partnership as well. Um. Uh, but yeah, specifically it was about so in terms of when you're looking at like species reintroduction it, it kind of got my um thoughts going and I thought maybe there's some specific Plymouth species that um could maybe benefit from a template which you guys have already done and and how we go about that but what what would be the um the bodies or like the governing bodies or platforms you would you would have to answer to if you were to uh, reintroduce a species um, into the environment and next one is how do you um with having such like a really good engagement that you've got with all your volunteers how do you manage that because we're we're a three-person organization so that that's number two um oh yeah there's only two that's it just those two <laughs> uh ben should i take the first one you take the second one yes yeah yep, sounds good so in terms of policy and stuff, when it comes to reintroducing species, I mean, it completely depends on the species that you're working on. So not all species are viewed the same in the eyes of the law. So for example, with water bowls, they're what we call, well, technically a schedule five species, which protects them from, um, uh, from, from harm in the wilds. For example, it's illegal to, to hold or kill a water bowl or damage where a water bowl is living. Um, however, that only applies to wild water bowls. So our water bowls are actually coming from Devon, from a chap called Derek Gow. And because they're captive bred, we actually don't need a license to move those water bowls. If they're born in the wild, we would. Um, and so it's, it's, it's sort of distinctions in the law that you have to be aware of. Um, but of course, for water bowl reintroduction, we had to ensure the environment, even though we didn't have to, we had to make sure the environment agency, we wanted to make sure the environment agency, Natural England, all the Hogsmore Catcher and Partnership were happy and it was a collaborative effort. So even though there was no policy requirement in that instance, we had we, we decided to make sure that we 
we'd do best practice to make sure everybody was happy. With grasshoppers, for example, again, grasshopper, the, the large marsh grasshopper isn't a protected species. So for the species itself, we don't need uh, a license. But what we do need licenses for is because we're working with triple SIs in this case, the New Forest National, National Nature Reserve, and, and where we're releasing our sites, some of them are triple SIs. We need licenses from the, um, the, the uh, Forestry Commission, and sometimes Natural England and stuff to do that. So that's something Ben's been working on. I don't know if you want anything around that, Ben, in terms of details. But um, In terms of that, yes, very much it, it depends on the regional area. So you'll have a relevant person to get in, in touch with, um, and they've just got standard protocols that you need to, to go through in terms of an application. Some of them, some of them can be quite detailed. Some of them are um a little bit more vague in terms of the applications but it's very much yeah it's case case by case um it's, it's, it's very useful to kind of strike up a, a fairly good working relationship with the the relevant person there just to help ease that process along because it can be quite long-winded and obviously they've got different priorities and yeah not a lot of time to focus on on that sometimes so um but yeah it's very much case by case different different protocols to go through um and with our beaver work, it's really complicated at the moment because we have to get what's called a 05 license Natural England. And just last Friday, we were having on-site meetings with Natural England and the Environment Agency, Environment Agency who are statutory consultees on that. So it completely depends on the species you're working with. The bigger the species, typically the more complex it is. Or if you're working in triple SIs, that's when it gets really confusing. But yeah, um, so yeah, it's all case dependent. And Ben, do you want to do the community engagement question? Also, just sorry, going back to the triple SI thing with the LMGs as well. Another good kind of thing to kind of smooth over that relationship as well is the fact that we're we're feeding back data to them that they well in terms of surveys that they didn't know about. So we've surveyed several different sites now down in the New Forest where they had no idea that LMGs actually existed um, or were clinging on. So I think in terms of the actual process being beneficial to them in terms of how they manage their sites as well and getting more of a baseline data across the new the new forest that's it's yeah it's of value to them as well um which has helped to kind of build that rapport um going forward um in terms of was it how we so was the second question how we communicate with the volunteers yeah i guess just because um it sounds like you have such a a large engaging sort of amount of volunteers like um yeah just how you know like how you upskill them and and how you manage that process because it, it seems like administratively it, it it could like pull a lot of resources so just how you've effectively done that or or do you have someone that does that for you as well sort of thing? um so we do that in a few different ways and it varies project to project um in the past we were kind of relying a lot on just spreadsheets of volunteers um categorizing them particularly the waterfall group so particular teams just seeing you know which which areas of interest they have um more recently we've streamlined that through the platform mailchimp um, so people, whoever they're signing up to our newsletter, they can opt into our volunteering newsletter um, to find out about any opportunities that we might have or other organisations have. Um, and on that, the way that we streamline it is we actually put different areas of interest. So it could be the waterfall project specifically, could be habitat restoration work under that, could be community engagement, it could be fundraising, um, and then they'll get relevant communications um, um, in, you know, in reference to what they've signed up for. Um, we also split that out more broadly. So if someone's just interested in generally taking part in surveys, um, they can opt into that area of, of, of updates or they can opt into um, yeah, restoration work or, or general volunteering opportunities. So in terms of the ongoing comms, it's, it's, yeah, it's very much just doing it through MailChimp just because it's easy to segment quite a lot of, of different individuals. So you can make sure they're getting relevant ongoing communications. In terms of how we keep people engaged, particularly with the water bowl project, what's been a key tool for that is being, well, it used to be in-person meetings, um, but then post-COVID, we now do an online meeting every month uh, where we have uh, a set agenda each time we go through all of the different areas of work um, and people can update on any project activities they've undertaken or any ideas they might have for any specific area of work going forward and that's been a really way a key way of disseminating information and actually progressing the project as well we've learned a lot about skills that volunteers have as well that they can then lend to the project to help us grow it um, which has been really valuable particularly with things like community engagement engaging schools um, and even actually 
things like our bioacoustic surveys. Um, it was through that, that platform of the call that we were able to get a volunteer um, who was telling us about the skills that he'd learned in bioacoustic survey methodologies. So yeah, that's been an essential way of, of engaging people. Uh, we also run for that project specifically, we are on, actually, and to an extent, the, the Grasshopper reintroduction project. So just training sessions. So for the Grasshopper project, it's once a year, we'll meet online. Um, so an online training session, but then there's also the collection day uh, where people go along to collect all of their equipment. And there they can speak with members of the project team, our lead entomologist, who will be able to answer any specific questions they have. Um, and then for that project as well, in terms of engagement, it's very much the two release days as well. So in-person meetings um, to kind of yeah, talk to people. Then in terms of the Waterfall project, we run regular training sessions for um, for checking the mink crafts. So we're regularly getting new people signing up who want to take part in those uh, mink surveys or using the floating rafts. So we run quarterly training sessions on a weekend uh, where people can just come along, learn about the project, um, and then also how to undertake one of those surveys. And then we can get them onto a specific rotor, um, depending on where they're based locally, so they can take part in them. And then we're going to start emulating that with all of our camera trapping and bioacoustic surveys as well. So having quarterly quarterly training sessions, people can come along and take part and learn about um, yeah, how, to, how to undertake those surveys and how to get involved. Um, and then very much the same with restoration sessions. So all of them will be discussed on the project calls for the Waterfall project. And then we will have through the relevant channels. So on that volunteer newsletter, we'll advertise all of those restoration sessions so people can sign up and, and take part. Um, and yeah, it's been, we had, it ranges from minimum around about 10 people on, on a Waterfall project uh, restoration session through to up to uh, kind of 30 people coming along. So it does fluctuate quite a bit, but in terms of, the ongoing engagement stuff so the project calls we average about 20 people each time um probably about core people, core 10 um and then people kind of jump in and out um on a monthly basis um so yeah hopefully that answers your question a little bit um yeah it's brilliant um how, how long have you been running just so i don't want to steal any just really just one last little one um how long have you been running the volunteer sort of like how long has the project been going for like um as in citizen zoo uh, so Citizen Zoo as an organisation launched in 2016. Um, we actually initially ran a rewilding conference, so bringing together practitioners working in rewilding conservation, but also um, other stakeholders like farmers, getting them together uh, for a conference, people to talk about their work, but also people to discuss like the movement of rewilding more broadly. Um, and then off the back that, of that, yeah, we launched our own projects, um, mainly the, uh, the water bowl and grasshopper reintroduction projects. So, the, the large grass marsh grasshopper launched in 2018 and the, the waterfall project really kick-started in, well, plans were taking place in 2017 when the last one was seen on the river, but um, the project really launched in 2019. And then since then, yeah, we've just been launching more and more kind of year on year, um, looking at kind of where the need is locally, especially, um, and thinking about how we can, yeah, create kind of innovative projects that meet those needs. Um, yeah. I liked your... Um the way you explained about how the term rewilding has changed because that I think that's a still something we all know what we mean by it now but I think you're maximizing diversity biodiversity and involving people was a really nice way of explaining it like we can use that when we're trying to explain to people what we mean by rewilding because people have a different thing in their head about what that means <laughs> uh, and the, the way this key thing of involving people is really important isn't it um and and i think when you've got like before this project i was working on the the devon great horseshoe bat project and by focusing on one species your you anything you do to help that species will help the habitats for other things but it gives people a really good thing to get involved in. people like that don't they if, or i'm on working on the grasshopper project or the water bowl but around that presumably you're looking at all sorts of improving the habitats because you don't want to release there's no point releasing something into a habitat where their numbers will just disappear again because the habitat's not good enough yeah absolutely we're a fundamental believer in umbrella species so using these sort of more charismatic species to be an umbrella for a whole ecosystem and habitat i think yeah 
is that hook that can get people oh, umbrella we call them a flagship species when we do it <laughs> Yeah, yeah, flagship umbrella species, both, both, both work. But um... I, I've got quite a lot of questions, but I'll just ask one. Um, in terms of getting a diversity of people involved, like it's easy for you in London because there's a huge sort of range of diverse ethnicities, all sorts of people. But I even then I noticed in your photos that there were a lot of traditional <laughs> conservation-y type older people. I, you know, I, I just wonder how you address that and, and it's it's harder down there in the southwest in a way because there's a less sort of diversity but how do you do that and how do you engage with other groups yeah that's a really good point i think um one thing recognizing that london is a population of about nine million with pretty much every faith every culture represented in it so if we can't do it why well, it should be well, it should be it should be easy for us effectively but it's not easy at all so so many of our in terms of our volunteers or that typical i think it's a general issue with conservation generally white middle class representation so we are trying to get engaged you know a horrible term i wish there was another term for it but the harder to reach groups um so ways in which we try and do that is actually go out to specific to those specific communities whether it be doing a talk for the local Muslim community or the local, for example, uh, Kingston's got the biggest population of Koreans in Europe. And yet you, uh, you wouldn't know that from our pictures, absolutely. So I think you've, you've really got to try and do as much targeted outreach as possible, but it's still very challenging. Um, we do have some, we have, we, I think our diversity um, inclusion statistics are probably improving, but they're nowhere near where we need them to be. Um, but I think you have to really be proactive and really try and encourage mm. it to happen. It's not going to happen on itself because, you know, you, conservation is a bubble, unfortunately, in many ways. Yeah, need to burst the bubble. <laughs> has, has anyone else got another question or any points to make, Hetty? Yeah, I just thought, hopefully you can hear me all right. My headphones yeah. have just decided to yeah, skew yeah. up. Um, yeah, really interesting, great range of projects there. I particularly like how um, you've kind of consulted with the community as well and had a lot of involvement for them in quite early stages. I, I really like that aspect. Um, I suppose just actually uh, building on that point that Helen's made and Owen's question as well about sort of managing your kind of volunteer networks. I was just wondering how you kind of reach out to different communities to get involved in the first place do you have you know, particular platforms that work better or um yeah just how you sort of then um, engage them in, in the first place it, it's quite varied actually so i think word of mouth tends to be one of the best communicate uh, communication platforms as well as uh, we've got volunteers who have flyers um, so, for example, when they're going out and checking on the mink rafts, we've got people you engage with, you, know, you get a lot of questions about what are you doing down there, like what is that raft? Um, and it's actually a great opportunity for people to you know, discuss the project and get people engaged in that way. Um, so that has been that has been good. Um, we also work closely with a local organisation called Kingston Voluntary Action Group. Um, and so they publicise all of our local opportunities and they, they help disseminate what um, activities we've co got coming up. Uh, also working closely with the local council as well, um, really useful for getting out into different networks and, and publicising upcoming opportunities. Um, but also leaning on the expertise of other community engagement groups has been really key for us. So on our Wild Tolworth uh, project, we're working with the Community Brain who are a specialist in um, community engagement, essentially. So they've been really useful in, well, opening up the Wild Tolworth project more specifically, but to um, a wider group of people, essentially, to, to try and cast the net a bit further. So as Elliot said, yeah, it's something that we, we are trying to work on, but with limited resources, it is difficult. Um, and it is something that we do need to try and address. But yeah, it is, I think it's very much about leaning on, on the relevant other stakeholders you've got within your network you can actually to help to disseminate some of those yeah activities you've got essentially coming up. Um, yeah, those are the main things anyway. Um, Hetty works at uh, the Wildlife Trust on a project called Wilder Communities. So yeah, that hence all the, any any ideas on how to engage people is, is always good. and. It is, it's always too easy to engage with the people that are already interested. <laughs> it's that it's the, how, yeah, how do you get to the others? Um, 
I don't know. Um, I mean, on I don't know, Emmy, are you are you there? <laughs> Maybe you know, on Green Minds that there's you're using a lot of different comms tools, aren't you? What are you finding is the sort of best sort of ways to keep in touch with people or to engage new people? That's a really good question. I think it's um it's a challenge that we always have. Um, but it's a good challenge to have because we it's one that we tackle through our audience segmentation plan. So we look at which audiences we are reaching well, which audiences we could reach better and how we can do that. And then we come up with an action plan about, you know, contacts that we have within the community or organisations and groups which are already embedded within those communities. So, um, for instance, we've done some work around Devil's Point, which is in the west of Plymouth, um, at a site which is also on the southwest coast path. So you know, the Southwest Coast Path are in touch with a lot of people who are working around that area. And as a result, we've all we've managed to match make a little bit and pair up. And um, I think as as um, as was said, I think it's about gatekeepers, isn't it? It's about champions within communities who are already expressing an interest, who are already in contact with or we know someone who knows that person. And then it's by word of mouth because that's very much a trusted embedded person within a community so as opposed to just green minds randomly sending an email which may well end up in spam or just ignored potentially not for any other reason that we're just an unknown entity but actually if we if we know somebody within that community it's coming from a trusted place and if we're working with communities who where there are sensitivities or vulnerabilities that's probably the best way that we can do that too so yeah I think um champions and gatekeepers are are how we're, we're doing that um, with our harder to reach communities and audience segments. Yeah, and, and, and I think with something like Green Minds, which is a sort of temporary project that runs out next year, it's making sure we're enabling all those different groups and people to be talking to each other. So there is um, a rewilding network, isn't there? I mean, is that right across the sort of across Plymouth? I don't know how that's developing, but that's trying to link or oh, there's all these amazing little projects and there's organizations and things going on that even I don't know what they all are but we can link people together and give them all the information and sort of and empower them to take things forward that that's good from our, the point of view of this particular project there's also a national rewilding network just on that point so led by rewilding Britain so then that's quite an active forum that you can jump on hmm. Yeah, we're, we're in touch. Um, we're also part of the Devon Rewilding Network as well. So we've got our Plymouth Rewilding Network and that's very localised. And then the Devon Rewilding Network where, you know, we can share practice from an urban environment. And then that's tapped into like the um, the broader rewilding network in country. So, um, yeah, there are some good conversations going on and plenty of um, I think Hayley's just put the link in the, the chat, actually, for anybody who's interested in our rewilding network. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's a good place where we can share some learning. And also uh, engaging with local councillors, I think, is is quite important. And we've done a bit of work uh, around some of the sites that we're working on around Plymouth and with just getting the message across to them, because they're often the ones that might be getting it in the, you know, from their, their the local people about something they don't like or want differently. And if we can get them on message on message with what we're trying to do, then that's um that's really good as well um do you i just wondered um i had a question on funding where do you, you said you get volunteers to help you with getting funding that's a great idea <laughs> where do you gen what's the bulk of your funding where is that coming from um so citizen zoo we're, we're structured as a cic uh, so we're not a pure charity but we're still and the, the, the rationale behind that was uh, we didn't want to be dependent on finite grants and that compromising projects. So we wanted to try and make sure everything we do has an element of sustainability. We didn't want to be, you know, at the whims of once the project comes to, once the funding comes to an end, we never want the project to come to an end. So, so that's part of why we embed our projects so much into the community because that in itself gives you a lot more resilience. But in terms of how our funding works, so we do have. Um, well, to, to say that we still the, the primary of our income is through grants from the GLA, which is the, the, the Mayor Authority for London, or through council or through general funding pots that I'm sure everybody is always after. Um, and then, but we do we're trying to build up our more sustainable income streams. So, for example, we're working with like local breweries who do like citizens' beers, 
and we get money from that and trying to develop our relationships with corporate entities. We've got a full-time fundraising officer who just their job was to go around trying to build up sustainable business partnerships with various um, entities just to ensure we have a more unrestricted income that we can, you know, invest into the strengthening the, the sustainability of the organisation and the, and, and the projects, I suppose. But we are still quite heavily reliant on 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 just you know funding bids which is a shame but we've got the aspiration to to um be more sustainable in how we fund ourselves that's correct any other questions hello i've just got to say i've got to um i've got to drop off now but um i appreciate okay. the invite and um yeah i really enjoyed the talk thank bye Aaron. thanks for coming <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you actually a couple of things about, you know, you've developed your responsible dog owners guide. I thought, is that, are you able to share that? <laughs> That's really useful. Quite like to see, read that. Yeah, it's, uh, we actually just finished it recently. We had a local illustrator, um, yeah, pull together a really nice document for us. Um, it's going to go to print in the next couple of weeks, but it's all on our website. So I'll send over the links for you. Oh, we can find it on the website. Yeah, great. Basically, it's kind of just a bit of a narrative about kind of, wolves through to dogs issues so that kind of leads to contemporary issues you know flea treatments um mm. and then proactive solutions on the back um we just thought it'd be a nice way to kind of bring it to life and have something a bit tangible that we can hand out to the dog walkers um because yeah we do a lot of work on the river so putting in things like dead hedges um just as barriers for, for human footfall but also dog uh, footfall um mm. And we get a lot of queries about why they're going in. Um, a few disgruntled dog walkers most seem to be on board with it. So we just thought uh, like a nice engaging document could be quite a handy um, thing to have. And that's what yeah. dog walks a bit will, be, will be all about, trying to engage those people and get involved. Yeah, it's trying to, because well, Ben has a dog, I haven't got a dog, but it's trying to make empower dog walkers to be the voice of change amongst dog walkers. Because if I came up to a dog walker with no dog, I'm not going to have the same sort of status that maybe Ben would have with his dog following him. So it's, it's trying to have... Um... You say following, <laughs> running away from it. <laughs> <laughs> You're following. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but the dog walk has been the voice of change in that, because it is like a community in its own sense. So rather than it feeling imposed, we're well, self-driven. Yeah, that sounds good. And, and you know, you mentioned those bioacoustic surveys. Is that a national... Do they do that nationally? Carbon, uh, carbon rewild do yeah. So they'll send it out to anywhere in the country, um, and then you just post it back to them. Um, and what's the sort of cost of doing that then? Because it sounded really useful. <laughs> uh, what do we? Survey, including the analysis, it's a matter of hundreds. So hundreds. I think it was three hundred pounds in total, and that was for the full report um, and everything. And they do all the analysis, and it was a very yeah, it was it was a very enlightening report actually. Um, it was a really useful document to have. Um, and that gave you was that the one that gave you like all the bird species? Yeah. So yeah. is it like birds and bats and is there anything else? There's or, small mammals as well as in like voles and shrews. <laughs> but yeah. What they just picked that all up on their Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty good bits of kit. We've actually just we've got five now which we're gonna start deploying out on the river. Um, but to do it yourself, it actually is quite a lengthy process and one that it's taken us a bit longer than we thought to actually work out the nitty gritty of, especially because we want volunteers to help with it. So we're just trying to work out the process ourselves and how that actually translates to on the ground. Um, but it is, yeah, it's good technology. I think it's, it's and, and, and they're really good to be fair. Carbon, I would really recommend Carbon Reward. Mm, that's interesting information to have. Any other questions or comments or things that people are working on? Yeah, I have one. Um, yeah, thank you for introducing me, Helen. I totally forgot that. Um, just wondering, Elliot, you mentioned that one of the reasons behind being a CIC and kind of having the heavy community involvement is that you have a bit more um, control over project legacy. I just wonder if you could 
give us any more details on that sort of expand a little bit because um so within the wild communities team um essentially my role is to support community-led action for nature so i'm moving very much away from delivery and more into kind of community organizing and community empowerment so it's really sort of flipping that when it's switched i'm very interested in about kind of uh, project legacy and how you sort of i suppose ensure that things still happen or you know, is it just a case of when species are reintroduced they're reintroduced so yeah yeah well i suppose a few things there one is by having you know i think like a water bowl that does send ripples through the community faster than maybe some other projects that actually works as quite a good hook to get people involved but i think because people have been part of this project from the very start we have volunteers that have been here from day one of the project they're actually helping us release water bowls three years on so we actually have a whole sort of community which is getting stronger all the time of in total of well the different ways in which defining the strength and breadth of our community but 350 people who actively volunteered way more when it comes to people who are aware of the project so we, it's very much that that whole project is embedded within the local community so for example if we did just go if citizen zoo just disappeared off the face of the earth tomorrow i'm confident there would still be the whole core of volunteers who are so committed to it that they would they would continue on in some manifestation even though that's not our plan but just to demonstrate the strength of the community and the will they've put it. Also, the effort behind it was quite interesting. When we had um, the people bringing the waterfalls for release a few weeks ago, they said they'd never worked with such a dedicated and sort of friendly group of volunteers. Part of that is because we're just working with nice people, but also that's the sort of ethos we've tried to build into the project. You know, they feel very much ownership over it because um, the waterfall release people say normally people just come up to get their photo want to throw a waterfall in the river and then and bugger off whereas here there's a real sort of community they've invested so much of their time and their energy into it they feel like it's something that they're generally proud of doing so i think it's just trying to embed that ethos in everything we do which is not easy right because that takes a lot of time and you really need and you do need to dead like ben spends a lot of his time actually coordinating volunteers which you know you could say is that a justified allocation of time i would say it is because you get those wider benefits but it's not something you can't just leave it to the community to do you need to have a framework for them to build around and then do it but yeah um yeah does that sort of answer your question um uh, just to add to that as well everything so those project calls it's not it's very much about we set like an agenda about you know what's been happening and what's going to be discussed but it is very much that it's an open discussion about ideas um, and people bring all sorts of different skills and ideas to the to the table um, and that helps us to develop the project and again kind of instills that ownership um, you know if people's ideas are taken up and carried forward by virtue of being discussed and accepted by the wider group then that you know obviously that instills that sense of ownership so I think it, it, the key way it definitely that I think it works is because it's very much we have that ongoing engagement that discussion about what we're going to do next and, and how we're going to achieve those targets. Um, I think, yeah, that's that's one key way that we've done it, I think. Um, you know, you mentioned the bio bed idea and you had those sort of criteria for things to plant. Have you got a, like a list then of what you would put in one of those? I, I could find a list, yeah, we have a list. It's yeah, not it's just quality, quite yeah. interesting idea. And I think, the, um, the council, Plymouth City Council, have got this, the way that they mow their verges, um, and most of it is cut and drop still, uh, but then there are certain areas are cut, going over to cut, being cut and bailed. But I think, yeah, the, the verges, they're generally the cut and drop ones, so, because, and also they, that would be really tricky, like the access to some of those that are in the middle of roads and things. So mm -hmm. I guess uh, constantly, it's only once or twice a year so then they're constantly kind of fertilizing the ground but um and in some cases i think it would be better just to leave it at the end of the year then wouldn't it as sort of overwintering habitat for various mm. invertebrates then cut it and leave it but then there's even more issues if you leave it all winter looking a bit scruffy then people don't like it do they yes. so councils can get machines that you know they're ride on mowers that have an inbuilt collection mechanism so it's not like you cut it and then go back and collect it so and the, and the, that makita oh, I, can't, I can't remember the name of the machine but um and they're being increasingly used um an issue is also 
not just collecting it, what what you do with those cuttings, because that then, you know, do you take it to, to green waste? One thing we encourage is we have lots of hedgerows in the borough, lots of woodland. So sometimes if it's if have a nearby hedgerow, we just say you can actually use it for mulch for a local hedgerow. Um, but yeah, it does present difficulties, but over time, because you're going to be actively reducing the nutrients within that soil, uh, that soil um, uh, setting, you will have a, a few years online, there will be, a, a, you know, an efficiency saved because you'll have a lot slowing, slower growing sward. So it's, mm. it's, how, it's, how, it's how forward thinking you want the council to be, but it's, it's not, it's not easy. Yeah, I think they're definitely moving in the right direction. And um, then they have each year, they each winter, their council, they meet to discuss the pro, the grass cutting home for the following year. And then they set that up. And uh, I know more and more of it is moving towards the a, a more kind of sympathetic management for the wildlife, which is really good. Um, how do you, um, I've got another question. How do you decide, like with your species-led projects, which species that you were going to focus on? And have you got some in, others in the pipeline for the future? And what, they, what are they? <laughs> um, so how we choose? Well, sometimes it's like what is appropriate for the environment. So for example, the Waterfall Project, was a result of the species going extinct, recognising the water vole's role in the ecosystem. So therefore, right on our doorsteps, we have a project because, you know, we want to restore. So that's slightly more defined. The large mass grasshopper project came more out of opportunity, discussions that we're having, identifying the need. But now we have got a whole pipeline that we're looking to do in terms of species that we're looking to work on, from white stalks to glow worms to common lizards. Uh, what else are we looking at, Ben? Potentially pine martins now, actually. <laughs> so, because so, the first London pine martin was recorded last week. Um, so, yeah. On the, uh, if you see on the Devon Wildlife Trust website, there's a, a section, I think, now about uh, pine martins and the project that we're, I think we're about to get a pine martin officer, aren't we? Really? Emily and Hattie? Yeah, so there's quite a lot going on here. So, if you, do go down that route and <laughs> probably get in touch with us. I'd love to talk to your Pine Martin officer, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then there's also yeah, lots of invertebrates that this could be, the, the LMG project could be appropriate for, like mole crickets and all sorts of things. So yeah. Um, yeah, well, well so it's, 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 it's it's the result of living in such an impoverished ecological landscape where we're missing so many important parts of that puzzle. You know, there's... there's yeah, and the green spaces in, in cities and towns can be quite crucial for that, can't they? Because some of them haven't had sort of pesticides thrown all over them and they haven't been improved so much. They just need a bit of more sympathetic management that, and they could really could really get things going. And we, we I like the glowworm idea. We've got... In the Wildlife Trust, we're, there's this Action for Insects campaign um, that we're trying to get people to sign up to. And again, it's like broadly helping insects, but I think it, within that, it'd be quite nice if we could focus sometimes on a, a single species and say, oh, let's help get the glowworms back. This is what you do if, and if it's similar things that will help lots of other insects. So I think that would be really good. Some, some species capture the imagination more than others. I think glowworms yeah. are in that bracket. Emily, uh, yeah, can I uh, um, go ask something about the BioBeds project? Um, I just wanted to check the three principles uh, that you had. I've, I've, I wrote down the one about um, being pollinator friendly or food plant for uh, for butterfly, uh, and the hardy robust principle. But did I miss one, or have I just combined two? And then also, I just wanted to check um, if that also works where, or if you've got examples in Kingston where um, communities are taking a, on ownership of beds. If that if I assume they have to follow the same rules. Yeah. So again, I think I think the councils quite like to just say the community will do it and then that just won't happen. You know, that needs to, mm. needs to be more, there needs to be more of a supportive structure around it. Within our landscape over the last five years, two friends groups have now become over 30 friends groups. So we have definitely a growing 
there's a growing wish amongst the community to contribute but you can't just say go contribute they need to be supported they need to have a framework you know so uh yeah uh i think people like to just sort of off put it on the community and they feel very much then that feels like they're being sort of sh shifted with a load and they're paying council tax so you'll be very sensitive how you how you manage those discussions and feel like you're in it together and you're empowering people not just giving them the jobs that you can't do because you as a result of budget cuts or whatever um but yeah um it's definitely happening um but then with the biobed principles that's, that's yeah basically it so and then we're going to come to pollinator friendly element making sure you've got flowering throughout the season so you've got early mid and late flowering plants just to provide that extra source when we're doing wild if we're doing wild flower sowing obviously we'd only do native species i think with biobeds we're not sensitive to mm. native or not it just you know we just want pollinator friendly no thank you that makes sense i suppose you could you could uh, i know one of the guys i work with at the council is very he's, he's trying to make planting far more um related to their net zero aspirations so he's got his list of things that you know absorb carbon etc and i'm sort of like next to him going what about all the pollinator friendly stuff and trying to find a list that kind of reflects both of those and i suppose we could just come you know come up with a you know a fourth principle or combine the two um, i quite like that it makes it quite neat and um and, and we've talked a while now about providing that extra support to communities who are taking on beds because it's not a solution as you say it you know it ends up being abandoned unless you've got you know quite a few people who are really keen so perhaps um, i can talk to them about creating more of a, a package that you provide people with a, a you know plan x of you know if it comes back to the council this is what will happen yeah yeah it does need you do need to invest significant time it's not an easy way out sort of thing mm. i think it is it it does require time and energy otherwise it just won't work yeah thank you So as it's quarter past now, and obviously as there hasn't been so many of us on this meeting, too many, then we've had time to get through questions. So if, has anyone got anything else, last thoughts or questions? Um, I will put round a little follow-up email later, just with a little evaluation link. <laughs> so I'll definitely expect Emmy and Haley to fill that in because they're always making everyone else do evaluations. So I just sort of check in and ask how the session went. Um, but yeah, I think if there's no other burning issues or questions or things you want to ask, um, ask away if there are. But otherwise, I think we'll sort of draw to a close.